One of the greatest evidences of freedom is healing. Unforgiveness refuses to let the wound heal, and pain becomes the identity of the unforgiving person. Unforgiveness is coming into agreement with God's enemy about whatever he says about the person who wronged you, not about what God says. If you are holding on to unforgiveness because the hurt is just so brutally big, I will be pleading with you to release your trespasser. Because whatever you think they did to you, worse is being done to you because of the open door of unforgiveness in your heart. If you have a Bible, I'd love it if you'd open up to Galatians chapter five and put a marker in Acts chapter seven. I told you when we started this series a couple of weeks ago that the first two weeks were gonna be a little, a little difficult to navigate for some of us. And uh, if you're already reading my geniusly artistic whiteboard, uh, I brought it back this week, not because it's just so awesome, but because I, I just need you to be confronted by the truth of God's word, especially those who battle what we're talking about today. We're talking about what I believe to be is the number one open door for the enemy. Two weeks ago when we kicked off this series entitled A Door is Opening, we spent that whole first message talking about open doors and strongholds and bondage, right? Now we need to talk about what I really do believe is the number one open door, unforgiveness. Havoc is wreaked in the heart which harbors unforgiveness. And as we read Galatians 5 together, some of you are going to be like, this is how we're starting the message this weekend? Yes. Galatians 5 verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Preston, this is a depressing way to start the message this weekend. No, it's a calibrating way. If you live in this fallen world as a Christ follower, and do not expect to experience hurt at the hands of man. These things, which we are guaranteed to experience in a fallen world around us. If you don't expect it, it's going to eventually hurt the way you follow Christ and love others. Being hurt is a guarantee in a fallen world. But a big part of bringing heaven to earth is forgiving each and every time we are hurt. See, a lot of us are running around going, rend the heavens, O oh God. Bring revival, Lord. And he's going, yeah, I want to. And the way I want to do it is through you forgiving the least forgivable person in your life. That's how I want to rend the heavens, Preston. That's how I want to rend the heavens, Sarah. I admit, though, that one of the single hardest aspects of being a Christ follower is forgiving others the way God has forgiven us. And this is why today's message will be painful for all of us. We're going to answer three questions. And question number one is, what are the dangers of unforgiveness? Part of my job this weekend is to make sure if you're choosing unforgiveness in your life, that you are very aware of the dangers you are embracing willingly. The first danger is a shocking one. I believe One of the most dangerous things about unforgiveness is unforgiveness is making an alliance, a demonic partnership 
with Satan himself. If I told you there were certain behaviors you could choose, which would create demonic partnership with Satan himself, would you be less likely to choose those behaviors? How many of you would be less likely? Okay. One of the most demonic partnerships man can make with Satan is in the act of unforgiveness. And here's why. Satan loves when we do not forgive because that is when we are most like him and least like God. Satan actually celebrates when someone hurts me and I choose unforgiveness. You need to understand that. Every time I choose not to forgive, God's enemy is like, yeah, that a boy. You're doing exactly what I would do, my boy. Unforgiveness is demonic partnership with Satan himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says, Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. Speaking to the church in Corinth, he said, For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one. Speaking of one person who was wreaking havoc in the local church there, he says, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Watch this next part. Lest Satan should take advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Now you hear me say that line a lot. We must not be ignorant of Satan's devices. But I think some of us forget the context of that line. Is Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saying, unforgiveness is an open door. And if we do not forgive, Paul's saying, this one, Satan is going to wreak havoc on us, among us. He's going to take advantage of us. And if this is war, don't make war easier for your enemy. And unforgiveness always does. Unforgiveness is coming into agreement with God's enemy about whatever he says about the person who wronged you, not about what God says. And here's how he does it. He uses the hurt we experienced from them against us. Unhealed hurt is evidence of an unforgiving heart. Unhealed hurt in your heart is the easiest way for the enemy to produce even more hurt. And the easiest human for Satan to take advantage of is the hurt one, and I can prove it easily. If I told you that your next meal, your entire life depended on your next meal, but you had no money and no food, and before you, I set two human beings who had meals in their hands. The first human is four times your size. Goliath-like. And the second human is on crutches. If your life depended on your next meal, you would die without it. And you had to take one of their meals. Who are you going at? Sickos? <laughs> you sickos! You're going to take advantage of somebody on crutches? Here's, here's the point. This is exactly what Satan does. I taught you two weeks ago, Satan is ro roaming around both realms looking for someone to devour. And one of the easiest people to devour is someone who's harboring hurt in their heart. You go after the one who's hurt. This is exactly why I will be pleading with you for the rest of this message. If you are holding on to unforgiveness because the hurt is just so brutally big, I will be pleading with you to release your trespasser. Because whatever you think they did to you, worse is being done to you because of the open door of unforgiveness in your heart. It makes an alliance with God's enemy. The second danger is bitterness. My handwriting is so awesome. Many people think that, that the first step of bitterness is being hurt or being wronged. That's actually not true at all. I know many people who have been wronged who are not bitter. 
So it cannot be step one of bitterness. Step one of bitterness is a refusal to forgive. This is where bitterness begins. When you re refuse to forgive a wrong done to you today, it always exposes the fact that you have not forgiven a wrong done to you yesterday. Another way to say it, unforgiveness is a learned behavior. And oftentimes, it goes back many, many years to our childhood. Things we're holding on to. Things the little boy, the little girl is holding on to in our hearts that we've not released. And it creates more space for more unforgiveness as people in a fallen world continue to hurt us. Bitterness is the emotional response you give anytime you stare at the sins of the one you refuse to forgive. We all have to make the choice. Will I choose the temporary hit which comes with being bitter towards them? Or will I choose the painful path of releasing them when I'm most hurt? Listen to me. What bitterness does to you is far worse than anything they did to you. This is why Satan loves when we choose bitterness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. You know I like to personalize scripture when it's a command. Preston, watch out. I'm speaking to you, buddy. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up because it will trouble you. Don't open that door, Preston. Bitterness feels good to the flesh, but is incredibly dangerous to our spirit and to our hearts. The third danger of not forgiving is darkness. These next two get more painful. 1 John chapter 2, verse 11. But he who hates his brother. Well, Preston, we're not talking about hate. Yes, we are. 1 Corinthians 13. Love keeps no record of wrongdoing. Right? Okay, so keeping a record of wrongdoing is the opposite of forgiveness. Right? Holding on to what they did, not releasing them from it. Okay, so if the opposite of forgiveness is holding on to wrongdoing, what's the opposite of love? Hate. So when we do not forgive, we are showing hate towards our brother or our sister. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Question, how many of you feel it is extremely challenging to navigate life in a fallen world? Second question, then why would we ever make it more challenging? By blinding ourselves with hate unforgiveness towards our brother and sister. It would be like running a marathon that you've trained for and you're ready to run the 26.2 and at the last second you make the choice to wear a backpack with your body weight in it. Cupcake, I don't care how fast you are or how in shape you are, you ain't winning that race because it's more than you can carry for that long of a journey. That's unforgiveness. It makes every lap in life harder and every step in life darker. And here's the fourth one, and this one rang my bell. I think this is the most dangerous aspect of unforgiveness. Distance 
from God. I remember when I was reading through scripture early on in my teen years, getting to Matthew chapter five and seeing something I had not noticed or heard taught before. Jesus says, hey, when you're at the altar presenting a sacrifice and there's something off between you and someone else, someone has something against you because of something you've done, leave the altar and go make it right with that person. Makes total sense to me. It's God's way of saying, Preston, as, as long as things aren't right between you and him, things are not completely right between me and thee, right? And it makes sense because I did something that I need to make right, right? That makes sense. But did you know there's another side to that coin because that's when I do something wrong. But the other side of the coin that we don't think much about is what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. He says, but when you are praying, first, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. Then, your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Preston, when you first come into my presence, if you don't forgive the ones you are most frustrated with, things are going to be off between me and you. I remember the first time he taught this to me. I've been around the block enough with him to know when I go to be alone in his presence and he seems a little distance, distant, I have learned to ask why. Sums off here. You, you, you don't seem as close as normal. What's the problem? And I remember one time the Lord saying, Preston, I'm standing over here and you're standing over there. And I said, okay, great. How do I close the gap? I'm just trying to draw near. And I felt the Lord say, Preston, the person who has hurt you most has come over here and asked me to forgive them. And I have. But because you are choosing not to forgive them and they're standing with me, you don't even realize you've made the willful choice to stand by yourself apart from me. Lord, I don't want to be distant. I, I, you, already, you already walked me through this for nine months when I was younger. I can't be apart from you. Well, then I guess you're going to have to do something about this. Yeah, but this hurts, Lord. What hurts more, Preston? The pain you're holding on to or the separation you're creating between us by not forgiving them? Unforgiveness gets in the way of your fellowship with the one who forgives you. That brings us to the second question. What are the benefits of forgiving? If you're someone who's presently willfully choosing not to forgive, I need you to understand the dangers of unforgiveness, but I also want you to understand and encounter and confront the benefits, the blessings of choosing to forgive. And here's the first one. The pleasure of the Father. One of the best parts about choosing to forgive is you experience the pleasure of the Father. Let me try and make sure you understand this. I'm a father. And part of my, I have four children, three sons, one daughter. And Part of my responsibility in conjunction and in unity with my wife is to establish our family values according to God's word and then to raise up our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord to walk out those family values according to God's word. I have learned something about me that rarely do I get more excited these days than when I see one of our children living out our family values. Now, I'm about to give you a little, a little peek into a couple of details of something in my life. I never talk to you about this stuff because it really doesn't matter. I don't put it on social media or anything. It doesn't matter what I do, things like this. 
but I'm giving you a couple of details so that you can understand as a father why I celebrated the choice of my son the way I did. Next weekend, I'm going to serve uh, a sports team uh, and do chapel for them um, before their game. And they reached out and they said, hey, uh, if, if you'd like to bring someone with you, we'll have two passes for you uh, on the field. So I reached out to my oldest son, who's a big sports guy, and I said, hey, you know I was doing this. Do you want to go with me? And you can be there on the field at the game, all the things. My son's immediate response was, let me check my work schedule. <laughs> now, I don't have the time to give you all the context for what's led up to that, but when I saw my 18-year-old son respond like that, I mean, my heart exploded. I was like, okay, dog. <laughs> so he responds back and he goes, sorry, dad, the schedule's already out, I need to work. I was at the office when he texted me that I couldn't wait to get home. Later that day, I went home. I walked right into my house. I went right to my son who was chilling on the couch with our five-year-old. I said, buddy, jump up. Give your dad a hug. I hugged that kid and I said, sweet Jesus, man. <laughs> All of our friends would say, this is like an amazing opportunity. And my boy said, daddy, in this family, what we do is the right thing, which is often the hard thing. I gave my word I'd be at work and I need to work. Okay, hey, listen, I'm just using that as a snapshot to show you. As a father, I celebrated when my child lived out our family values. I have a question for you. If I asked you to describe the family values of God's family in the most concise way possible, how would you do so? I actually think scripture shows us a way. Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. The best way to describe the family values of God's family in the most concise way possible is this, to live like Jesus, the Father's one and only begotten Son. Now, if I asked you, Describe for me in the most concise way possible what it means and looks like to live like Jesus. How would you do so? I think scripture shows us a way. Luke chapter 23, verse 33. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed Jesus to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for doing this to me, for they know not what they were doing right now. Forgiveness in real time. And I believe the Father seated on the throne as Jesus passes the final test. Forgiving in the midst of the sinning. On the throne, the father said, while this is painful to watch, that's my boy. This is what we do. We forgive even while they're killing. And this is how the father celebrates you when you live out the family value of living like his son by forgiving the least forgivable person in your life. Preston, I need you to forgive this person. God, I don't want to in my flesh. This pain is so great. I don't even want to talk about it ever again. I can't forgive them. My flesh doesn't want to forgive them. God, why do I have to do this? And the father says, Preston, because forgiveness is one of the best ways to crucify your flesh. The parts of you that don't look like me. 
And so I ask you to be like me, to kill the parts of you that are nothing like me. And so you must forgive the person who has hurt you the most. And I celebrate every time you do. Because forgiveness is a crucial part of crucifying my flesh simply because I never look more like Jesus than when I forgive like Jesus. Here's the second thing, benefit of forgiveness, the peace of Jesus. The pleasure of the Father, the peace of Jesus. I've tried to teach you since day one Satan loves war. Well, what's the opposite of war? Peace. Satan hates peace because it is the opposite of war. And Satan loves unforgiveness because it causes and perpetuates wars. You show me a war, and I guarantee you I can show you acts of unforgiveness. And I think one of the biggest reasons why Satan hates peace is because of moments like John 14 when Jesus says, hey, to all of his disciples, the road you're going to have to travel in this fallen world is going to be excruciating. But I'm not just sending the Holy Spirit to help you. I am leaving with you a peace the world will never understand. There are two ways to see peace. One way is a strong sense of calm no matter what. But the other definition of peace is a lack of conflict. See, peace is something we actually have to fight to protect in order to live in the peace Jesus left us. Think about it. You remember when Peter says in Matthew 18, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? You remember what Jesus said? He took the number of perfection, seven, and he multiplied it by 70. He's like, let me take the perfect unending number, seven. Now do it 70 times that much. In other words, do it every time. All the time. For all time. But does anybody know the verse that comes before Jesus saying, forgive your brother who sins against you 70 times seven? Does anybody remember the one verse before those two verses in Matthew 18? I'll read it to you. Verse 20, Jesus says, for where two or three gather together as my followers or in my name, I am there among them. Jesus says, listen, I need you all to forgive. Because unforgiveness is the way Satan creates division. Do you know the fastest way for the devil to create war between me and you is to get one of us to choose unforgiveness. War is on and division is created. It's as though when Jesus said, peace I leave to all my disciples. And then we read in places like Psalm 34, 14, seek this peace and work to maintain it. Satan saw peace is something Jesus leaves us, but we have to work to maintain and protect it. And it's like when Satan heard Jesus say that, he went, game on. War is on. Peace is what you want to leave him? I'm going the opposite direction. War, baby. The fastest path to war is unforgiveness. If I were to try and describe for someone in this room who is choosing unforgiveness because they are presently dealing with someone who is in an ongoing manner sinning against them, they won't stop it. They won't shut up about it. They keep dialing it up even more. And it's like a tornado of increasing activity. Here's what choosing unforgiveness is like. I grew up in Texas and 
we had tornadoes. And some people had something called a tornado shelter. What's a tornado shelter? It's an underground structure designed to protect people when a tornado comes. But here's what unforgiveness is like. Unforgiveness is like having access to a tornado shelter, but being so brazen that you choose not to go into the shelter for protection and the tornado is coming, ground zero is over your roof and you walk out in your front yard yelling at the tornado going, you want a piece of me? You want to dance with me, old man? Bring it on. Whereas unforgiveness says, no matter how much you keep kicking up more debris in my life, I am going lower. I forgive you. I'm not touching your tornado. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. And you would be shocked to know how easy it is to fall asleep in a tornado, just like Jesus did in the storm. It's easy to fall asleep in the tornado shelter because you made the choice to stay out of the winds. And with it, comes the peace Jesus was talking about. Where a heart forgives, there you will find a greater measure of peace, which only Jesus can give. That brings us to the third benefit. The pleasure of the Father, the peace of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians 3.17, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is There's what? Anyone ever been in bondage before and set free? There's what? says the person who understands what bondage is excruciatingly like. I have been in chains. I don't ever want to go back to them. But one of the strongest chains Satan uses against us is the chain of unforgiveness. And many of us think about the sins of those who have sinned against us like this. The sin, that sin is a chain in the life of the trespasser until forgiveness is received. Well, what they did to me is gonna be like a chain to them until they humble themselves and ask God for forgiveness. That's true. This is what David described. He said, until I confessed and repented of my sin, my body wasted away. He said, I, I was in emotional, physical chains until I repented. Absolutely. The sin of the one who trespassed against you serves as a chain to them until forgiveness is received. But there is another side of this coin. Unforgiveness is a chain in the life of the one trespassed against until forgiveness is given. Jesus forgives. And wherever Jesus is, forgiveness is. And where there is forgiveness, there is freedom. Which means, wherever there is bondage, you will find unforgiveness, some measure of it. One of the greatest evidences of freedom is healing. Unforgiveness refuses to let the wound heal. 
And pain becomes the identity of the unforgiving person. Have you ever gone into the doctor's office and when you went into the waiting room, they made you fill out like six pages of paperwork? And it's like every time you go, and you're like, did I not just fill this out six months ago? If we have any doctors in the room, if you could do something about that, please. <laughs> I'm not gonna sue you, I promise. I just don't wanna fill out paperwork like I'm buying another house. To try and help you understand, when your heart needs healing from the surgeon of heaven, and you go into the waiting room, before you can go in to be healed in your heart from the hurt, the required paperwork is forgiveness. You will never be healed of the hurt until you forgive the person who brought the hurt. Preston, I can't forgive them. You don't understand what they did to me. There's a world of difference between I can't forgive them and I will not forgive them. I'm not asking you if you can because I'll agree with you. If what you mean is in your flesh, apart from God, you cannot forgive this seemingly unforgivable sin, I agree with you. In your flesh, you're not capable of that kind of forgiveness. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm about to show you, you most definitely can forgive. Now, I want you to see the, the levels of forgiveness before we ask, ask and answer the third question. There are four levels of forgiveness, and the lowest level of forgiveness is what I'll call refused forgiveness. The lowest level of forgiveness is no forgiveness. I'm never forgiving that person. Okay, that, that's the lowest level of forgiveness. It's non-existent forgiveness. But the second lowest level is what I would call conditional for forgiveness. You know what that is, right? I will forgive this person when this, 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 and this takes place. I will forgive this person if they ask me for it first. Conditional forgiveness, which leads to the next level of forgiveness. What I would call granted forgiveness. Jesus talks about this in Luke 17. If your brother sins against you and comes and asks for forgiveness, forgive him every time. Right? This is granted forgiveness. Well, what's the easiest way to describe granted forgiveness? It's asked for. You give it because it's asked for. Some of us are refusing forgiveness because one of our conditions for forgiveness is that they ask for it. And that leads to the fourth, most expensive, most excruciating level of forgiveness. Unrequested forgiveness. Remember, when Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother every time he sins against me? Notice Peter doesn't say, when he asks me for it. Jesus is talking about unrequested forgiveness and he says, Preston, here is the goal for your life. I don't want you waiting until they ask for it because some might not ask you. They might ask me, but not you. And if you don't forgive them, you're still in bondage to what they did to you. And so I need you to work to get to this place right here where you can forgive even and especially when they never ask for it. And this leads to 
the last question we must answer before we do the heavy lifting. How do I forgive? How do I forgive? First step, acknowledge your own sin before God. Isn't it just like God to start a conversation with you and go, hey, listen, we need to forgive some people. Okay, Lord, I don't want to do this. This is going to be hard. How do we start this whole thing? And God goes, let's talk about your sin first. Isn't that just like God? You go into his presence and you're like, we need to talk about the sins done against me. And he goes, funny you should bring that up. We need to talk about the sins done against me. Preston, yours. You want to know why the process of forgiving someone else of their sin must start with us acknowledging our sin before God? Because the easiest way to be self-righteous, to fixate on their sin as a mechanism to distract me from my own sin. This is why Jesus said, stop worrying about the splinters. Address your own log. I try to tell people, listen, if every time you go in to be in the presence of the Lord, if you rarely end up repenting over anything, I don't know that you even went in to be alone in the presence of the Lord. Because when you really understand you're going into the presence of the perfect one, you start to get really good at confessing your imperfections. Because you realize, if I don't address them, if I do what David did, David's like, I'm not that guy. I don't do things like that when Nathan set the, the theological trap for him. Whoever did that needs to pay and die. And Nathan goes, you are that man. If you go in to be alone in the, pres the presence of the king of the universe and you don't ever find yourself saying, woe is me, I am that man. I'm worse than anybody can imagine. My sin is so bad that it separated me from God. That he had to have his son murdered for me. Because my sin was that bad. You know when you spend time talking to the Lord about that, it completely calibrates your heart and your mind about the sins everyone has committed against you? This is why step one must be acknowledging your own sin before God, which leads to step two. Receive forgiveness. For your sin. From God. Get it from God. Receive his forgiveness. Once you say, what was me? I'm a woman of unclean lips. Father, I need your forgiveness. Here's what's so amazing. This, listen, this is why I want you to go in to the presence of the Lord and every time start with repentance. Because he draws nearer when we remove the sin that got between us. And, and there is nothing like going into the presence of the Father and saying, I have sinned and I need you to forgive me. And the Father is saying, I know. And I've already paid full price for it. Son, daughter, I forgive you. Tell me what tops that. Daddy, I did wrong. Stop acting like you didn't do anything wrong. You're only pushing yourself further away from the Father. You did wrong. I did wrong. Have others done worse? Sure. But does their sin separate me from God? No. That therefore means my sin for me is worse than their sin is to me. And I must receive, you must receive his forgiveness. You cannot extend forgiveness until you first 
learn how to receive forgiveness. That leads to the, ser- the third step. Acknowledge their sin before God. Remember, forgiveness is not acting like nothing happened. See, some kind of teach this. When you forgive, it needs to be as though it never happened. Here's the problem. There are consequences to every single choice we make. So to pretend nothing happened actually makes the problem worse. Because if I pretend nothing happened, then what is the flesh of that person more likely to do? Do it again and do more of it. So we have to acknowledge their sin before God. Think about it. There'd be no need for forgiveness if there's no sin to acknowledge. If you put a marker in Acts 7, flip over there. Because I know when I teach on forgiveness that there's always someone in the room who is going, Preston, I'm not in the same camp everybody else is in. When I was a child, someone perpetrated demonic evil against me. It's an unforgivable sin. I cannot forgive that person. I will not forgive that person. I understand your position. And I am humbly submitting to you while begging you to ponder and consider this thought. That is your choice to make. But you better get comfortable with bondage. Preston, don't talk to me like that. I'm not really trying to talk to you. I'm trying to come at the enemy that has been using what was done to you to keep you in chains since you were a child. I love you too much to leave you there. I wish to God I could take away what was done to you. And just hearing the words, acknowledge their sin before God, literally makes your skin crawl. Well, Preston, it's easy for Jesus. He was fully God, not just fully man. It was easy for him to be on the cross and forgive his killers. I'm not Jesus. Well, I'm about to show you in Acts chapter 7, the man who was not Jesus, but was living to be like Jesus. Verse 59 speaks of a man named Stephen who was living so well like Jesus that those who did not follow Jesus couldn't stand Stephen for doing so. And one day they got fed up with it and they grabbed a bunch of rocks. And verse 59 says, they began to stone him. They began to kill him. And while they were murdering him, Stephen literally praised this prayer. Lord Jesus, while the rocks are hitting his face and the mouth, receive my spirit. And one more thing before my last breath. God, do not charge my murderers with this murder. He acknowledged their sin. He acknowledged it was wrong by calling it sin. But he did the fourth step. After acknowledging their sin before God, he extended forgiveness to them for their sin before God. In your flesh, it is impossible to live like Jesus especially when we talk about hurts in your heart, which must be forgiven in order to walk in freedom. By the power of the Holy Spirit, 
with his dying breath. The man being murdered extends forgiveness to his murders. At the end of the first message of this series, we did some heavy lifting kingdom business, and we're going to do the same right now. In the same way I did in the first message, I'm now asking for every head not to be bowed and every eye not to be closed. And if you are in this room, presently experiencing by willful choice the act of unforgiveness towards someone who has hurt you and wronged you, and you are ready to walk in freedom and release them, I'm asking you to possibly do one of the most courageous things you will ever do in your life. I'm asking you to stand. Just stand. It may go back to your childhood. It may go back to last weekend. I'm harboring unforgiveness in my heart, Preston. And it's an open door for the enemy, and I know it. And I want the door closed. My flesh doesn't want to forgive, but I'm done living like this. Anybody else want to stand? That away. That away. That away. Forgive the one who abandoned you. To forgive the one who cheated on you. To forgive the one who violated you. To forgive the one who stole from you. To forgive the one who beat on you. Anybody else? Preston, why are you making everybody keep their eyes open? Because what you're doing deserves to be celebrated. Because on the throne right now, the Father's going, yes! The enemy's been using this to wreak havoc on my little girl for decades. Yes! You deserve to be celebrated for what you are doing right now. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of God is, there is forgiveness. Forgiveness and freedom go hand in hand. Anybody else before we go through the four steps? Okay, I'm asking every head to be bowed now and every eye to be closed. And for everyone who's standing, Let's start with step one. Boldly go into the presence of the king of the universe and begin confessing your sins. Confess your sins in this matter. Well, Preston, I didn't do anything wrong. I was a child. Totally understand that. But I promise, since then, you haven't been perfect. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Just begin to confess your sins before the Lord. Not just acknowledging them to God, but reminding yourself, you are that man. You are that woman. I am that man. I am. And now step two. As you've acknowledged your need for forgiveness, Hear the Father look you in the eyes of your heart and say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I release you. No debt is owed any longer. Paid in full. I forgive you. And now step three. After acknowledging our need for forgiveness and then receiving his forgiveness, now 
this might be a little bit harder. I want you to acknowledge their sin before God. God, what they did was wrong. When they did this, it was wrong. It dishonored you, it dishonored me. God, I acknowledge wrong was done against me. Just begin to lay it at his feet. Lay their sins at his feet. You can't carry this any longer. Only his cross can. I know. I don't understand. I don't understand it all. I just know that we are never more like Jesus than we forgive the perpetrator. I'm not saying remove their consequence. I'm saying lay their trespass at his feet. And now, possibly the most challenging of the four steps. In your heart, or even quietly there with your mouth, I'm asking you. Just like Stephen and just like Jesus, to say to the Father, Father, forgive them. Do not charge them with these sins. I release them. Chains falling. And now, I'm gonna ask you to do something maybe no one ever has. One of the evidences of forgiveness is the ability to bless. I want you to begin to pray a blessing over the one you just forgave. Bless them, Lord. Bless them with your mercy and grace. Bless them by removing the cloud of confusion. Bless them by removing the darkness. Bless them by removing the bitterness. Bless them by closing the doors they've opened. Father, we don't just ask you to forgive those who have sinned against us. We ask you to bless them in spite of their sins, just like you have blessed us in spite of ours. Father, forgive them, and oh, that you would bless them. In Jesus' name. And every free person who has forgiven today said, Amen. I hope you were blessed by this message, and I truly hope you heard the Lord speaking to you through it. Before you go, make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new message is posted. And make sure to leave us a comment below sharing what God spoke to you and how he used this message in your life. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.